Hello, and welcome to Baker McKenzie's Resilience, Recovery, and Renewal podcast series, dedicated to helping your organization navigate the full continuum of the COVID-19 pandemic and beyond. Whether you're managing the immediate crisis, stabilizing operations, or evolving your business, this podcast will cover key insights to help strengthen your organization's capacity to respond, recover, and thrive. My name is Jennifer Northam, and I've spent over 20 years as a producer and journalist covering international business issues for leading news organizations. Welcome back to the Baker McKenzie podcast series. Today, we're going to do a deep dive into the future of work. Now, Baker recently held a virtual series called FutureWorks, which was a really interesting series of discussions with some of the most innovative companies in the world. The talk centered around how global employers are embracing some of the trends that have emerged during the pandemic. Everything from remote working tips to mental health and well-being, diversity and equality, and also better ways of communicating with a workforce that's remote, and those that are often juggling work and life simultaneously. Now, we've all seen quite a lot in video calls this last year. We've seen our colleagues' children. We've met their dogs, their goldfish, even their delivery people. Now, I've not seen yet if today's guests have any pets, but I do know that they have a lot to add to the conversation, and they're going to give us some great insight into how employers can navigate through some of these big issues. So without further ado, I'd like to introduce Mike Brewer. Mike is Global Employment and Compensation Group Chair at Baker McKenzie, and Anna Brown, Baker McKenzie's Chief Inclusion and Diversity Officer. And just so you're aware, we're recording this podcast from our homes in light of COVID-19 social distancing rules. So apologies if you hear any unusual noises. Now, Mike, let me start with you because you kicked off the series with a really insightful keynote from Margaret Heffernan. Now, for those unfamiliar with her, Margaret's a former BBC journalist, she's an author, and she's a businesswoman. And Margaret really set the scene. She said the pandemic has taught us a few lessons one of which was that people are really good at change. Another was this issue of trust and that businesses have learned that they can trust their employees more than they thought they could. Now, a year on from the pandemic, Mike, what have been some of the lessons learned for those companies that you work with in regards to change management and trust in their employees? Yeah, Jen, uh, change and trust, those are two daunting concepts to many companies. And Nevertheless, we saw a number of companies that we work with having to pivot very quickly to cope with the disruption of the pandemic. And working from home, that was one of the main changes that started to happen fairly early on. And we've supported a lot of companies in making that adjustment. It had to be done very quickly. And many employers, they didn't have a choice in it. Uh, what, What we've seen, as Dr. Heffernan said, is it's really made people more productive in in some cases. And in some companies that we work with, they've adopted remote work as a long-term or even a permanent solution because uh, they found that it works. And in terms of trust, well, yes, I mean, there certainly is a significant amount of trust that employers have had to give their workers in letting them work from home, And that's because they can't control the work environment. There are other people in the employees' houses. They can't see what the employee is doing. So it's it's not necessarily so easy to monitor performance. Uh, There are solutions to mitigating these risks, but it does require trust on the employee's part. Now, the other uh, big word, change, uh, you know, we've inevitably seen a lot of restructuring and cost cutting by companies. And we've seen this in the face of economic disruption that the pandemic has caused. So in, in general, what we often see when companies go through any type of significant workforce change is that people will resist the change if they're simply told about it or directed to do it rather than asked about it. And you know, many companies have legal frameworks that consider this and they require a, a consultation with employees over significant changes. And the companies that succeed in bringing about change, no surprise, are usually the ones that go that extra mile in consulting with their staff. Now, Margaret, she also spoke about leadership and the importance of leaders in motivating their employees and how they need to do that differently. It was refreshing to hear her thoughts on how businesses need to use their imagination more in times of unpredictability. 
have you seen companies be more imaginative in their thinking? And can you give us a couple of real life examples? Oh, sure. I mean, to encourage imaginative thinking, we need to encourage engagement. And a, a lot of us just can't have that quick chat over the, the coffee machine or, or the water cooler. So we need to be more proactive at creating avenues for our employees to, to really engage with each other. And Margaret Heffernan talked about the idea of developing our team's capacity for creative thinking and collaborative thinking. And, and we have to enable that by allowing more channels for collaboration. And in a, by way of example, I mean, some companies will designate a specific time in the week for you know, water cooler or coffee chats or even a specific platform or a channel for what would normally be you know, office banter and chat in the office, but now it's, it's virtual, or for more focused activities like knowledge sharing on a specific issue. It's really about carving out time for these channels of communication. One company's chief product officer suggests that we put more effort into hiring for creativity and, and developing creative talents within the workforce. I was reading a Harvard Business Review article that talks about the idea of hybrid work requiring a new operating model and a strategy that encompasses flexible work. And you know, that's everything from inclusive space design and innovative technology solutions. And, and the idea is that the modern workplace requires companies to meet these new employee expectations, connect to a more dispersed workforce, provide tools to create, innovate, and, and work together to solve business problems. Now, and at, on the DNI front, how is it that companies need to be thinking about leadership and the, and the need to motivate employees differently? Thanks so much, Mike. Uh, uh, I, I couldn't agree more with what what you were saying in terms of creativity, imagination, and, and how that best um, uh, can be uh, seen um, and developed. Uh, we certainly know that diverse teams are a source of creativity. Um, and we also know that diverse teams are better positioned for innovation because of that. But also companies have to create not just policies, but actual practices um, uh, that foster uh, a culture of inclusion. We've certainly um, seen in, uh, and heard of some very interesting examples of how that's happening. So for example, one company in the automotive industry uh, has announced that they have set parental leave for 24 weeks, but it was for all employees in all countries. Um, certainly that's a move that would help to reduce the gender gap and, and to support career development. Uh, we've also seen um, and heard that uh, in terms of these policies, how they apply you know, more broadly, and in this case to, to all genders, uh, not just women, um, but also um, to, to different types of family structures. So adoptive, foster, surrogate parents. So really you know, very broad to be more inclusive. One company, for example, uses AI and machine learning um, to help them to remove uh, gender biased language from job descriptions uh, so that that's helpful in terms of its efforts in diversifying its, its applicant pool. And then we've seen other companies um, who've publicly committed to making sure that they're being inclusive in every um, part of the process of doing their business, for example, at the creative process and focusing specifically on making sure underrepresented groups, uh, and, and in one case, this was uh, making sure that their black professionals were engaged in their product development um, and also meeting the needs of uh, their, their consumers, particularly the diversity of their consumers. So I, I think those are a couple of examples, Mike, that uh, come to mind, but certainly support what you're talking in terms of the need for creativity and the way that drives innovation, which is so key today. Now, creativity is obviously extremely important, but so has been resilience. And resilience has been a word that we're not going to forget once this pandemic is over. And it was another topic of conversation that was brought up often in the Future Work series. The question of how can companies not only remain relevant, but remain resilient through these uncertain times. Now, Mike, what have you seen companies do to remain resilient? And what are some of the best practices that you've seen? Well, Jen, there's a lot out there if you look for it. And I put it into two buckets, individual resilience and workforce resilience. In the individual resilience bucket, 
uh, well-being initiatives seem to be leading the pack. And these are things that address mental health fitness, physical fitness, and, and companies who get ahead of it tend to build a more resilient you know, workforce and individual employees than those uh, who ignore it. Those who ignore it tend to have a number of employees leaving on various types of, of leave. In the workforce resilience bucket, you know, there are different types of employment contracts, uh, building in this flexibility that, that Anna was just mentioning and some of the examples she was giving, training workers, upskilling workers, and, and being quick and nimble to respond to the needs and the, the changes within the business. And one of the things you mentioned earlier, Mike, is, you know, when we look at the future of work, it looks very different depending on the company. You have those who are keen to get everyone back in the office as soon as possible, and some are already there. Some whose uh, companies who've told their employees that they can work remotely forever. And those who are creating more of a hybrid solution. And each of those come with their own set of challenges and legal hurdles that need to be overcome. What are some of the main things that companies should consider when looking at those various structures within their own organization? There are a ton of legal and practical issues to change to a remote or even a remote hybrid working structure. And this is something that Shella Neba from Slack pointed out during the, the discussion at FutureWorks. And, and we're seeing that hybrid solutions are being more highly favored by those companies that can accommodate remote working. On, on the legal side, tax is out front, immigration requirements, benefits, health and safety. On the practical side, the question is, how is this going to be managed internally? How should requests be handled? What kind of policy should be in place about applying for work remotely? What agreements need to be drawn up? What information should employees be given about remote working? So the issues are, are plentiful. They're all solvable, but companies need to allow room to change their plans. And we found that employee surveys, getting, getting an understanding of what the workforce wants is helpful in being ready to respond. The bigger issue is talent. I mean, the talent pool will grow and will be more flexible, and companies that understand that can harness that expanded ta talent pool with a remote workforce. One of the issues we've seen with people working remotely has been the mental health and well-being of employees. And that's been a major issue that's been brought to light throughout the pandemic. In one of the future work sessions, we heard of a World Economic Forum report that found 62% of employees globally consider mental health issues to be a top challenge, but only one in six felt supported by their employer. So it's really clear to see that there's more to be done in helping companies through these tough times. Anna, what are your thoughts and what are you seeing companies doing to tackle this issue? Certainly we've seen the focus on well-being and particular mental health has been magnified during the pandemic. What's been helpful is the fact that We've seen greater discussion around the topic um, of, of well-being, um, also greater engagement um, in terms of, of well-being and uh, mental and, and physical health. And we are seeing a lot of uh, proactive ways in which um, they are supporting their people, um, which is fantastic. Um, so one example um, I understand from uh, uh, Krista Pratt, uh, who's the uh, uh, Vice President and Chief Employment Counsel at Biogen, had shared with us um, some actions that Biogen uh, took recently to prioritize employee mental health. Essential workers were facing a, a dramatic increase in their um, home and professional workloads. Um, and so one of the things they did to address that concern was to offer a childcare benefit. So very responsive to, to a particular need. Um, also, uh, you know, as employees shifted from um, working obviously from work to a home office environment, that happened very quickly, and uh, certainly that had an impact, you know, from a financial um, uh, security standpoint. And so, to help address that, uh, one of the things done was to uh, to help them adapt uh, to that additional cost of setting up a home office. Um, that they issued a seven hundred and fifty dollar stipend to their entire global population. And um, this came with uh, no caveats or, or needs to, uh, to produce receipts. And so I think those were two very practical um, things that uh, you know, have been shared with us. And I've also um, heard a number of companies have 
put some restrictions um, around uh, internal video calls. Uh, so some companies have no video calls on Fridays or no video calls on Wednesday afternoons. And I think that's helpful, you know, as we're hearing from, from people how video fatigue is real over the past year. So those are some examples I think are very helpful to kind of address some of these serious issues. The, the one thing I would add too is that it's so helpful to have the discussion, right? To have the narrative, to talk about it, to ask people what would help, to kind of get that type of feedback from uh, and discussion. I think that's part of what's been successful in terms of when you're asking people what, what would help, what do you need, having that dialogue and, and conversation. It's great to hear all these examples of so many companies really being more empathetic to employees and really embracing the health and well-being. Mike, what do you think leadership's role is in all of this? And, and what are you seeing work best? I, I'd go back to Krista Pratt at, at Biogen. And she said, leadership needs to set the tone. And, and that means training leads and training managers to have those conversations that Anna was mentioning uh, about health and including mental health. And an organization might have a great mental wellness program on paper, but you know, they may fall short of living it out. I think there's some concern, and, and it's a legitimate concern, about employee privacy. And those conversations tend to be taboo or, you know, to put a finer point on it, the person initiating the conversation doesn't want to overstep their bounds and cross the line into getting into a private you know, matter that they, they shouldn't. But there are some things that leadership should be doing, you know, having more frequent check-ins with managers and their teams and speaking openly about mental health issues and removing the, the stigma and encouraging conversations about it. In, in, in other words, you know, not just talking the talk, but, but walking the walk and having that commitment and, and tone setting. And a diversity, equity, and inclusion that plays a huge part in the future of work. And most of the guests that spoke throughout the future work sessions touched on the importance of having a diverse and equitable workforce. In your future work session that you moderated, you asked your guests a great question. You asked, how can companies move the corporate agenda from being about diversity to being about engagement and inclusion? What are some of the best practices that you've seen in this regard? I think it's an important question that we all have to ask um, and um, to do so frequently. Um, some of the things that that we've seen, and certainly, um, you know, one of my my favorite uh, people uh, is uh, Renee Myers, diversity uh, strategist and, and advocate, um, who is uh, uh, at Netflix. And uh, many years ago, she coined this term that says diversity is being invited to the party. Um, but inclusion is being asked to dance. And, and I know that's been quoted many, many times in, in several uh, different places and globally I've seen it uh, quoted, which has been fantastic. But what does that mean? What we're really talking about there is that it's so critical for organizations um, to focus not just on who's making up your workforce, but the engagement of that workforce. Um, so to be successful, implementing uh, not just a program or a policy, but a strategy um, that ultimately seeks inclusivity um, and full employee engagement. Like that's the work of inclusion. It's about that engagement. It's about belonging. Um, so that we're not looking at diversity and kind of checking a box, but really to have some authenticity, you know, with regard to creating this culture of inclusion and this deep understanding of really what's working and what's not working. And, and that may be different in each organization um, because I don't think it's a one size fits all. And this is part of, I think, engaging with your people and, and how you drive what is at the end of the day, a real culture change within, within the organization. So some of that um, I think is very helpful you know, in terms of how we're looking at this in, as, as we move forward, having a greater impact um, really to ensure that, uh, as, as uh, Mike said, is starting at the top with regard to, to leadership um, in doing this work. One of the things that we also talked about at our, our future work session is with this component of what's equity. So right, a lot of focus on diversity, inclusion, but also adding an equity. Um, and what is that about? When I think of equity, I think about it's how are we leveling the playing field? And so um, one of our fantastic uh, uh, contributors and speakers was um, Ritu Basin, who's 
an author and global recognized expert in diversity and inclusion. And one of the things that she shared with us is that organizations have to embed equity into the work that they're already doing. So not a separate on the side, but really looking at how do you embed that. And I think this is also you know part of this work in terms of, of culture change, but, but looking at um, equity and recognizing that equity can be impacted by historical legacies. Um, and so when we look at this, we have to be very bespoke and understand um, kind of the broader picture with regard to equity and, and what that means. It's heartening to see so many companies really embrace this and try to take this to the next level. In the last future session, we talked about how to communicate with one another because obviously it's extremely different when you communicate with people and colleagues over Zoom and working from home and we all, you know, we spoke about Zoom fatigue and how we connect with people virtually. And we spoke to Erica Dawan, and Erica is the leading authority on what's called connectional intelligence. And she said the most powerful asset we currently have is how we do connect with one another. She provided some really good um, suggestions on how to connect intelligently while working in a remote and sometimes quite chaotic environment. Now, Mike, I wanted to get your thoughts on that. What have you seen in this space? And what do you think companies should be doing to ensure that employees not only feel really connected, but are communicating with one another the best possible way? Well, Jen, we've seen a lot of really fun and creative, imaginative ways of engaging over virtual means, both within our own organization and and beyond. And some of our offices have set up Uh, regular coffee chats to encourage social engagement or marked out days where online meetings uh, can be avoided or optional. Uh, I've heard of people having walking meetings to encourage getting out of the house and away from their desk. There are lots of online and virtual experiences that can help bring teams together. Uh, One of our offices did a virtual murder mystery as a social event. We've had Uh, cooking classes and magic shows and and other things. I think the important part though is to keep the connection, companies need to be open to new ways to connect. I mean, early on, uh, quarantinis, uh, the virtual happy hour was successful, but a month into the pandemic, they kind of lost their luster. So being open to new ways to connect and trying a variety of methods to increase that connectional intelligence that Erica spoke about, that's key. And not forgetting the value of one-on-one connection. It's one thing to have a, a team meeting, but a lot of the real deep connections are done one-on-one. And whether that's over Zoom or over the phone or some other means, uh, keep that in mind. How hard is it and what are companies doing to have employees really embrace the culture and to maintain that culture throughout the pandemic? That was one of the first concerns, I think, when we had to pivot immediately, you know, from a workplace um, experience to um, work from home and how to maintain our organizational culture when physically we weren't with each other. And I think, you know, it goes back to what Mike said earlier about not having those touch points at the water cooler and, and lunch and, and such. And so it was a tremendous concern. And I think that one of the ways that we've addressed that culture is by staying close to people. One of the things that I believe has come out of the pandemic is the discussion and need for empathy um, and uh, vulnerability, you know, things that we weren't talking as much about before the pandemic and, and recognizing the critical aspect that it plays on how we engage with our people, how we build our culture and, and, and you know, with regard to, to our, our workplace um, and uh, making sure that you know, people are staying well. All of these things I think have been so critical uh, to that. At Baker McKenzie, we have a culture of, of friendship. And just because we're operating in a different environment doesn't mean that the, the friendships go away. It's just a different means and method of communicating. And to some extent, especially for those of us who in the past shared the same office and now are working remotely, it becomes more of a temporary long distance friendship. And there are still many ways to connect. It's just different. My final question to both of you, as we look towards the future of work, 
What do you think might be maybe the three most important things that employers and leaders really should be thinking about as they lead their organization out of this pandemic? The thing that comes to mind is understanding that not everyone is ready to return to normal and that some out there are actually dreading it. And you can call it, you know, re-entry syndrome or cave syndrome. We've been forced into relative isolation and gotten accustomed to it. And I think companies need to understand that it may take some time to allow employees to re-enter gradually. I agree with that, um, uh, Mike, in, in terms of having that, that flexibility. And certainly, you know, for, from my lens, uh, you know, diversity, equity, and inclusion are the things that we have to continue to promote and discuss and to, to recognize that the importance that it plays as we look at the future of work, particularly looking at some of the practices, um, priorities placed on diversity, equity, uh, and inclusion. I think we have to be consistent in that, not just in a time of crisis, but all the time. And so there, there are three things that, that I could highlight just in terms of the aspects that, that I think are important. Um, certainly, you know, with regard to recruitment, retention and promotion, and, and then the impact that has on, on community. And so as we go forward, the talent pool and opportunity to recruit it is you know, incredibly uh, critical. Um, and being able to look internally, um, you know, how we're doing that is something that kind of self-reflection um, within an organization is, is incredibly helpful. Uh, Mike mentioned earlier about responsibility, that there's an organizational responsibility and an individual responsibility. And I always think that they're parallel when we talk about diversity, equity, and inclusion. Um, certainly, when we look at recruitment, um, you know, many companies are aware um, in greater discussion around internal and systemic type barriers. That, that can impact um, their ability to, to recruit more broadly um, and to have a, a broader and, and more diverse workforce and how they're addressing that. And then, of course, having a diverse workforce we talked about is you know, one part of it, um, having a culture where people can uh, feel they're bringing their best and doing their best is, is particularly important. Certainly that inclusion part correlates very strongly with employee retention. It's important for people to feel that there is an authentic uh, commitment at every level of the organization, but particularly in leadership with regard to uh, that commitment, um, looking to make sure you have existing policies, of course, but also the day-to-day -day practices that we talked about in terms of being able to advance and have opportunities. And then, of course, the impact, right? It's so what is the impact on our communities? What is the impact on our businesses? Uh, we know from the pandemic, the strain that it has placed on women um, and communities of color and certainly conversations around um, anti-racism and uh, initiatives to um, address that and to support employees um, and that deep commitment within organizations is something that you know, we hope will continue to progress um, and we continue to see progress there. I just want to thank you both so much for joining me today. It's been a really interesting discussion. We've had a lot to learn this past year um, and we've made great strides and it's been great to get these insights. For those of you who'd like to find out more, you can still watch the Future Works sessions on demand. Just go to bakermckenzie.com forward slash Future Works. Thanks again. For those listening, we'd love to hear from you. Feel free to send any comments or questions to 3R Podcast at bakermckenzie.com. That's the number three, the letter R, podcast at bakermckenzie.com. Or contact us through the Baker McKenzie social media accounts. Use the hashtag resilience, recovery, renewal. More information on this topic is also available on our website at bakermckenzie.com. <laughs>